I want to say that our guest today is Howard Emery, who's making a return appearance. We so loved your presentation on birds a few months ago, Howard, and we're grateful to have you come back and share some of your pictures and observations. And it looks like, based on the pictures that you shared with me, we're going to be looking at birds of the winter, birds we might see around here uh, going forward. Is that right? Yes, actually, we're going to focus on birds of the winter, but but really the, the focus is more on, on birds that are on the water because a lot of our migratory birds here um, are away during the breeding season, which is in, in the summer. And so in the winter, we have a lot more ducks and, and uh, larger, colorful, visible birds on the water. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Okay, well, with that, I will um, I will share the winter bird screen that we put together here and um, let you take it away. Thank you. So I um, wanted to... Uh, I wanted to focus on on the birds, as I said, that are that are on on the water, and um, we could see the first picture. It's just um, seeing birds on the water is oftentimes a really colorful and uh, pleasurable experience. This is obviously the the uh, communicate uh, the, the center house at at, Bl at Blodell, and um, and there are almost always ducks on the water during the winter, especially. And um, so we have ponds and uh, a lake uh, on the island that um, give us a chance to see birds once in a while. But most of the birds we see are on, on seawater, on, on salt water. And um, these uh, these birds typically um, do spend time in Alaska or uh, northern Canada. Uh, during the breeding season, um, and they raise their, they hatch their eggs, they raise their young, they uh, teach them to fly, and uh, well, at least they allow them to mature to the point and take care of them to the point where they mature enough that they can fly, and then they fly back here for the winter, because it gets really, um, so because we have a more moderate climate here, uh, obviously, this is a better place to spend the winter than than in the ice and snow. Each of these bird species has its own pattern of behavior, and this helps us to, to identify them. Um, there are birds who live around the edges of the water and, and stay on shore, and we, and we hardly ever or never see them in the water. There are others that stay close to shore, but they, they either are standing or swimming in the water and they uh, feed in the shallow water. Uh, there are birds that spend most of their time out in the deeper water and you don't ever see them that close to shore. There are those who seldom fly and, and um, there are other birds like gulls and terns that are, spend most of their time or a lot of their time flying around. And um, there are water birds which can be either on salt water or, or fresh water. And there, some of the birds you almost always see in flocks of, of, a, of several or, or even many. Um, and all of these differences are helpful when we're trying to identify what we're seeing. I suppose the, the most typical water bird, of course, is the duck. And we have a quite a, quite a variety of ducks living around us on our island. Turns out that ducks, geese, and swans are all in the same bird family. They have webs between the free front toes, three front toes. They have long necks for the most part. Flattened bills often have uh, small teeth on the edge so that they act like a strainer so that when they feed off the bottom, they can uh, strain out the uh, water that they take in or some of the debris that they take in. Uh, if they're feeding in, in deeper water and, and then go into a 
school of fish they can they can uh, strain out the water and uh, and swallow the fish birds are the only living things with feathers although for for decades it's been a controversial and subject in science it is now accepted that birds are descendants of dinosaurs it is concluded that feathers on dinosaur fossils appear to have been formed for insulation, not for flight. Feathers have evolved as increasingly complex structures. Waterbird feathers are made up with multiple sharp barbules. These are tiny hooks that are on the edge of the multiple strands of the feather, the smallest part of the feather, and they hook onto grooved feathers that are adjacent to them so that they form a protective surface. Um, it, it's really acts just about like Velcro. And then in addition to that, the bird feathers tend to be stiff and curved so that they hold closely to the body. And so the skin of the bird can be kept relatively dry even when it's, uh, even when it's diving and swimming underwater. Underneath this protective covering um, is duck down. These are shortened feathers, which are very effective insulation, keeping the body warm. The duck down has been shown to be the most efficient insulation known. No other material, natural or synthetic, matches down's combination of highly effective insulating properties and light weight. That's from David Sibley, who's a prominent ornithologist and a well-known bird uh, guide author. We have several types of ducks in the surrounding waters. Our most common duck, of course, is the next slide, the mallard. And I think we probably all know what male mallards look like. And now I... Is there some way that... No. So Reed, we need, we need the next slide. There we go, thank you. Um, you all know what a mallard looks like. Uh, the male mallard is, is spectacular. Um, the dark green head, the yellow bill, the white necklace around the base of the, uh, <clears throat> the head, and then the brown breast. And the, and, the, and the bright orange legs. If you can see all of that, uh, it, you're, it's easy to identify the mallard. It's harder to see that in the center of the wing on the side of the bird here, uh, partially covered by the, the uh, lower feathers, is a, it's called a speculum. And I'm sorry, I don't have a good picture of that, but but both the male and female have this little blue patch with white borders that is in the middle of the wing. And, um, and that makes it, that's another identifying mark if you, if you don't get a good look at the bird, especially if you're looking at the female. If we go to the next slide, you can see that when the sun shines on that green head, it's almost iridescent. It really, uh, is, is a very bright color. And the next slide will show that when the birds are in the water, the, um, there is a, the lower portion of the feathers that are um, adjacent to the water can be folded up over the wings to help keep the wings dry. If we can see the next slide, you can see that the, the, Lower, the lower feathers are, are up covering the wings in that. They are, um, the, the, the mallards do tend, to, do migrate, especially in the nor northeastern states. Um, they'll go to Canada or Alaska like our northwestern birds do. But in, in our in our particular climate here, we're uh, moderate enough that we that they don't really need to migrate, so that they tend to stay here all year round.
the female, if we can see the next slide, is a, a brown model duck, not, not nearly as spectacular as the male. And that's true in almost all, in, in, almost, in, in many of the birds, uh, but especially in the water birds. Um, because the ducks um, sit on the nest, and so they, their plumage allows them to be camouflaged enough that they can uh, be more difficult for the predators to find. Here you can see that uh, the ducklings, these, these are probably uh, three weeks old or so. The ducklings, uh, there's, there's a, a, a collection of eggs, uh, 10 to 14 uh, eggs laid at one time, laid in, in one nest. Now the female lays the eggs over a period of several days and it and builds the nest usually some distance away from the water. So she will lay lay eggs and then go back and spend time on the water with the male and leave the eggs, leave the nest unattended for several days until she gets a full clutch of eggs. When the eggs are laid, the female begins to sit on the eggs and the male leaves the area and, and, and stays away the rest of the of the nesting season. The female will sit on the eggs 23 hours a day for approximately a month before the eggs hatch. When, the, when she begins to sit on her nest, the heat of her body starts the bird development so that all of the eggs hatch about the same time. The newborn are termed precocious, meaning that they are able to swim and walk and sometimes even find a little food uh, within less than 24 hours. However, the ducklings are very vulnerable. Fewer than half of ducklings survive the first two weeks of life. Predators include foxes, cats, birds of prey, predatory fish, and even bullfrogs. Within 60 days, their wing feathers are fully developed which is termed fledging, and they're able to fly. They will be able to breed by the following spring. The mallard species, interestingly enough, is the ancestor of nearly all domestic ducks. That is those raised for meat, and we can go to the next slide, or pets or soft feathers um, so ducks are also raised just to collect the down. Mallard ancestors have been raised by humans for greater than 4,000 years. They are the source of all, of, of most of the duck meat, not all. Most, most duck meat, including Peking duck, is, is actually a mallard that, that is bred to be white. And um, sometimes around ponds in, in city parks, you see these partially white ducks that are hybrids between the mallards and, and, the, and the domestic ducks. Um, ducks are commonly cat categorized in two major groups. Some feed on the surface and, and they're called, um, many of these are called dabbling ducks because dab that indicates that they feed by tipping their body forward so that their tail is sticking up in the air and they're able to, in shallow water, they're able to still feed off the bottom of the pond or the edge of the shore. Of the shore. Um, they are, um, they, f they feed mostly on plants. Sometimes they get insects or small crustaceans uh, from from the bottom of the pond, occasionally uh, a frog or a small fish. The second group are the diving ducks who are found in deeper water and they spend their time swimming underwater and, and catch fish that way. In addition to mallards, the next slide will show us the other common surface duck which is seen on the island and that's this is called the American widgeon. 
And these are the very common ducks that um, occur. They, they, they come early during migraine season. So we, they've been here for about a month. And um, they uh, tend to stay in large groups. Um, a couple of days ago, I was down um, out of Linwood Center and, and there were over 200 widgeons in one um, one group that are that were in the in the bay there just behind the buildings at, at Linwood Center. The American widgeon um, is similar in markings is why we distinguish them but but you can see the male has a white stripe across the top of the of the head and then you can't you can the next slide will show i think a little better the color the of the stripe behind the eye which is green and then the gray mottled uh, chin and the rest of the duck is fairly plain markings the next slide will show the female and it's, <coughs> it's a little out of focus, but you can see that the head, the whole head is the uh, modeled gray experience, gray appearance that uh, is similar to the chin of the male. Then we have um, another surface duck that is really not, not seen very often on the water, and that's the next slide. And that's the wood duck. This is one of the most spectacular ducks, certainly in North America. And um, and they, as the name implies, they tend to uh, live in uh, in brush around small ponds or lakes. And they actually nest in the trees. And um, they uh, eat berries and nuts. Um, uh, and 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 insects as well, but but most mostly they're eating um, vegetation. Um, a lot of birds have as most birds I think have a gizzard, which is a secondary stomach. But in the wood duck, it's particularly important because when they're eating nuts, they they can even eat and digest acorns. And, and so the food passes through the initial part of the esophagus and past the crop, which is just stores the food temporarily until during the digestion process. And then it goes down into the gizzard. And the gizzard is very muscular. In fact, so muscular that it can grind up some of the hard food. But in order to augment that, these ducks will eat a little gravel uh, and so that the gravel inside the muscular stomach will help to grind up the food and that's the way they have, have a successful digestion. And then the next slide we're going to begin so we have several species of diving ducks. This is this is probably the other really spectacular bird that's in our waters, and it stays uh, offshore, but but uh, tends to be close to shore. But but it, it is a diving duck. It's, it eats eats uh, by uh, diving underwater and swimming and catching fish. Um, it's a very very beautiful, uh, spectacular bird, and tends to be uh, solitary. That you you seldom you can see a couple together sometimes, um, but you don't see large flocks of, of harlequin ducks. Um, I, I've uh, yeah, I've seen them here off of uh, Crystal Springs, um, and it's it's really fun to to find them. Then we're going to go to um, look at a few other of the common ducks that we see here. This one's called the buffle head. 
And this is quite common. You see small groups of them together. They're often in mixed flocks with other species of, of ducks. This is only a 10 inch bird. So it's a really uh, small compared to a lot of the other ducks. And uh, the male is, is obviously brightly marked, so it's easy easy to see. You can see that the back of the head is the, is has the white crown, um, has a typical duck bill that's dark, and then um, other than the black back, it has a, just a white underbody. The next uh, diving duck is the scop. Now this bird is not so common here. We see them as solitary usually, uh, only a few at a, only only occasionally. Um, there are two species of scop. They look very similar, and um, and they have. Um, you can see the coloration here makes them makes them a little easier to identify. These are about 13 inch birds, so that they're a little little larger than the buffalo heads. And um, then the next bird. Oh, this is the this is the female buffalo head. Sorry. Um, yeah, and um, this is also it's also obviously only ten inches long. You can see that that white marking on the cheek is an easily identifiable mark. Um, there is the the, um, the female scop appears has has the same has similar markings, but um, but it's a larger bird. Um, and then other diving ducks that we see. The next one is oh, another spectacular bird. This um, is a surf scoter. We have three species of scoters, and they're and they're sometimes all three seen here together. They tend to be in small groups, and we see them often around um, the ferry dock. Uh, they they are you can see them in the middle of the Puget Sound, um, so they 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 go to deep water, but um, but they're often they're more easily seen, of course, closer to closer to the ferry. Um, and um, they are, uh, you can see that large bill, they, they eat uh, shellfish and uh, they're able to crunch the uh, shell of the clam um, with, with that large bill. And then there's um, one other, well, so this is the surf scoter. The, the other one is the other two species are similar, but they don't have uh, they don't have the same colorful bill, and, and and they don't have as large a bill, and they have some some small black some small white markings on the on the wings on the side. But this, the surf scoter, you, you can see it here, has a white patch on the back of the neck which uh, makes it easier to identify from, from a distance. Other diving ducks, which we rarely see here, um, we'll, we'll get to this one in a minute, but I wanted to mention the eider ducks. Um, everybody, I think, knows the name eider down. Um, the duck down the eider, eider ducks are seen off of Scotland, um, off of Alaska, Alaska or the Aleutians, and um, living in in colder northern waters, they have a, a heavier down, and so eider down is a, a very sought after product to insulate uh, jackets or bedding, um, and um, and they are sometimes hunted for those for those things, but we very seldom see them uh, in our waters. Although the the bird books say we should see them once in a while. But, um, then there's another. Um, it's still in the duck family, but the the mergansers, um, which is the next slide, 
um, are a group of birds that um, are a little bit less closely related to the, the mainstream ducks. You can see from this picture, even though it's at some distance, that the bill is a very long, is a very thin bill. And doesn't, they don't have the, the same type of duck bill that, uh, that a lot of the other ducks have. And all of the mergansers tend to have that long, thin bill. This is one of the most spectacular mergansers. Well, it is the most specular, spectacular mergansers seen here. Um, you can see the white on the crown in the back of the head. Um, and at a, at a distance, sometimes you could, you might mistake it for a buffle head. It's a slightly larger bird than the buffle head, but the, the lower body is, is totally different. You can see a lot more color and patterns in the, in the, uh, in the lower body. Uh, the next slide will show how unfair life is because the male here, even though the crown is not as spread out, um, is spectacular and the female is a pretty drab little creature. You can see the next slide. Um, the females to have that crown, but it, it, it it's just a fuzzy patch of fur that's on the, on the back of the head. There are several species of, uh, of mergansers, um, but uh, and, and we do we do sometimes see um, a common merganser, which is a is a much larger bird, um, and um, quite different in appearance, actually. Um, I think I think well I think a slide of that in, in a few minutes. Um, then, separate from the duck family, are other birds that look like ducks. Well, no, these are, I should finish up with the. These are also diving ducks. Uh, these are called golden eye, and you can see from this picture, even though the focus is not that great, that that uh, there are distinctive markings on the cheek and also on the patterns on the wings on the side of the bird. There are two species of golden eyes seen here. One, the, the common golden eye and then the, and then the barrow's golden eye. And the patterns on the wings are different between the two and then you can distinguish in that way. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, pictures of the other types. And then the other, then the next category that I was starting to mention, um, the, uh, you know, here's the, here's the uh, common morganser, which is um, not, not seen here very often. Like, uh, so we see more of the hooded, hooded morgansers, but you can see, even though this is a significantly larger bird. This is a 16 inch bird. Um, it still has the same thin long bill. Now we're going to get to where I started which is the loon and, and the grebe. Um, loons, loons and grebes even though they look like ducks um, are not ducks. Um, They're of course closely related but but um, the loon has a more fascinating <clears throat> symbolism, I guess, in our society. Um, in the first place, you usually see loons by themselves, and they they uh, are more they spend more of their time on, on freshwater lakes than they do in the ocean. Although we do see loons off of our coast here uh, once in a while. This is a, a common loon. There are several other species that are not seen here very often, or not mostly not seen here at all. Um, the, uh, the name implies that they are somehow distressed by the power of the moon. So they're called, so, so they're, 
there's a comparison made between loons and lunatics, which, <laughs> which I thought was kind of a, a kind of a reach, but whatever. Um, loons are uh, they're diving ducks. They they swim in fish underwater. They're some of the best swimmers. They can they can dive as deep as 200 feet deep underwater and stay underwater for 15 minutes. Although usually they dive much, much shallower and, and, and stay underwater for only about a minute. But, but um, they are migratory and, and they um, are seen here during the winter time, um, like the other migratory birds. Moon, loons are also known for carrying their chicks on their back. So either the male or the female, the, the loon, in, in d distinct from the mallard who has 10 to 14 eggs in a clutch, the loons only have one or two eggs and they will carry the one or two chicks on the back of the adult uh, for the first few weeks um, until they can fend for themselves. And then another group that is similar to the um, similar you know, only in that, that they look like ducks and that they're not really they're they're closely related but they're not ducks, not in the ducks family I should say, are the grebes, and um, and we do have some grebes here. They're they're more um, I, I don't see them very often in in. Uh, a little more difficult to, to identify. Um, and um, we sometimes see them here uh, at the beginning of the breeding season when they're beginning to show their breeding plumage. But um, I, don't, I don't have any photographs of that. So then to come back to the rest of the duck family, <coughs> Geese and swans are also part of the duck family. Um, obviously, the Canada goose is the one that we know the best. Um, they are a spectacular bird. Fifty years ago, they were fairly rare here, only really seen in the wild. But the next slide shows that they're now commonly seen on uh, people's in people's yards. This is the <laughs> the uh, main house at the at Bloedel again. But, um, and, and they can become a real nuisance, as you know. Um, <coughs> the, um, they, they don't have any, they're not very careful about their bathroom habits. And so when you have many ducks on your yard or, or ducks on a golf course, for instance, I uh, shouldn't say ducks, I'm sorry. Canada geese on your in your yard or on your golf course, um, it makes it very difficult to to uh, avoid their droppings, um, and then and they can be a real nuisance. Um, the next slide. Oh yes, but even you know when when a, the, they tend to respond in groups, they tend to stay in small flocks, and. Uh, when a when a uh, small flock of Canada geese take off, they're usually honking as they fly, and it's a very distinctive honk, and 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 it's a it's a beautiful sight really to see them them flying overhead. And we're going to talk about another group of birds that are commonly seen here around the water that are not ducks? Well, no, we'll get back to them. We'll go do that next. Here's the other, oh, that's right, sorry. Here's the other geese that are commonly seen in the Northwest, not commonly seen on Bainbridge Island, of course, but this is in the Skagit Valley, which is between Anacortes and, and Mount Vernon, uh, and around La Conner is the center. And, and because there are extensive fields of grain and, and flowers that are cultivated in this area. Um, migratory birds tend to use this as a, 
either a wintering ground or at least a resting ground. And so there are 300,000 snow geese. The next slide will show what a snow geese, snow goose looks like a little, up a little closer. And there, there are 300,000 of these birds that migrate from Alaska down <coughs> to the States. Um, 50 years ago, only about 20% of them stayed in the Skagit Valley. Now 50% of them, they say, stay in the, in the Skagit Valley. And, uh, and um, so you see, you can see thousands of birds in, this, in the air at the same time. And um, it, it's, it's obviously a very, um, a very colorful sight. Um, it, it makes a nice day trip if you wanted to go up to some, go up to between, go up to around, around La Conner. Um, and um, it's any time probably between November and April, um, you're likely to see f f the flocks of snow geese. And, um, and they are um, feeding off of the um, off of the, uh, the 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 gleanings, I guess, as we would use a, a biblical term, uh, from the, the grain fields that they have up there, and um, um, it's a spectacular sight. It's worth a worth a, a trip, and if you want to get more information, they, of course they have bird festivals and so forth in Laconer, and and uh, I think. The next one's coming up virtually in January, but um, but uh, that you can check that out. Uh, the Audubon Society uh, has a, a, a website that, that will tell you about whatever their festivals are. That's that's worth visiting. But the other bird that migrates through the Skagit Valley is, are the swans. There are two species of swans, I believe, and I'm, I'm not really an expert on this, but I believe these are trumpeter swans. Um, they are a little bit larger than the, uh, the tundra swans or whistling swans, um, but they're very similar in appearance. And um, of course, with their long necks, they, <coughs> they are um, really spectacular birds. And, and um, they also, they're, they're in much smaller numbers, probably about 10,000 of these birds in the Skagit Valley. And they um, tend to stay here all winter. And, and um, the next slide will show what they look like when they uh, take off, and, um, which is a really dramatic sight. Swans, of course, have a lot of um, history um, and, and are well known in mythology and Russian ballet. And um, but but these wild birds uh, are, are native here in in in, in, in North America. Um, the next slide shows what's called the mute swan. Um, and this is not a North American bird. This is a Eurasian bird, which is the, the bird that has made the swan famous in, in, in Europe. And um, it, you can see, has the, the orange bill. This is, there, there are um, a small colony of these birds that have um, learned to live in the wild uh, around um, the eastern United States, but um, but they are um, um, not native to our, and they they're not. In fact, there's some some efforts effort effort to control their populations. Um, you see the next slide. You can see that these birds can be very um, uh, aggressive. Uh, this is a painting from an art museum, obviously, but um, the mute swan in, in particular 
can be very aggressive, can attack uh, attacks other birds uh, and chases other birds away. So, so we we're not they they are as controlled and as to how much they're allowed to spread. Um, and uh, and they can they will attack uh, people if 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 you if you bug them too much. Um, now I think we're ready for the next category of birds, and these are the cormorants. Cormorants, I'm sure we all know what cormorants look like. Cormorants are very common, especially around the. They they love to sit on pilings, um, and they uh, part of it is they they uh, tend to they need to dry their feathers a lot, which which we can talk about, but. Um, you can see these, this bird here, especially the upper bird, has an orange base of the bill. And this identifies this as a Brant's cormorant. Cormorants are, are generally black birds. They're quite large. And, um, and they are excellent fisher, fish, fisher persons, fisher creatures. They, I remember from high school, um, or grade school, probably, that they told stories. Uh, we learned stories about cormorants, that the Chinese used cormorants to help them fish because they would tie a little strap around the neck and then they would have the cormorant go in the in, go fishing, and, and uh, but they couldn't swallow the fish, and so they'd bring the fish back up and, and give them to the fishermen, well, and regurgitate them for the fishermen. Um, Cormorants are very efficient swimmers. They have a specialized kind of outer feather that doesn't connect like the Velcro that we described earlier. And so they allow water to come into the, um, in, among, under the feathers. The inner feathers are still tightly uh, bound to the body so that they, the water, they, they still keep the, the skin relatively dry, but they are able to take on as much as 20% of, to, to increase their, to decrease their buoyancy by 20%. And that allows them to swim more, stay underwater more efficiently. And, and then, and so they are very efficient uh, fishing birds because of that. Um, after they've been in the water for about 20 minutes, it says, um, they get enough weight in that, under the feathers, enough water weight that they have to, to dry out. And, um, and so you'll often see these, the cormorants sitting um, on pilings or um, close to the ferry dock or uh, even on rocks around the ocean um, with their wings spread out so that they can dry out. And um, they are, um, and you can see, we can see them flying by. They have a very distinctive profile when they, when they fly by. Um, And then the I, I'm running out of time here, but the last thing I want to, we can skip this slide. It's a great slide. I, I love this picture of the California condor, but this is not part of our lecture. Sorry. <laughs> and and we do have occasional osprey uh, on the island, uh, which uh, are called fish hawks because they tend to go fishing by uh, catch, catching fish by d diving on them. And the next slide, another osprey pair. And the next slide, oh yes, Sheila was kind enough to, in, to show me where I could find Henrietta. And Henrietta <laughs> uh, is a great blue heron. And um, the great blue herons are 
about three feet tall and they're uh, very commonly seen in the shallow water where they can stand for hours even um, because they're waiting for and looking for fish to swim by um, and they uh, are able to they don't spear the fish but they they uh, will spring on the fish uh, opening their jaw at the last minute and, and catching them in their mouth and then um, they they will bring the fish out of the water and sometimes they're holding the fish in their beak but they in order to swallow it they need to have it head down and so they sometimes flip it up in the air and catch it so that it's head down and then and then they can swallow the fish and as if it's a large a heron this size can eat a one pound fish and and when you see the heron swallow a large fish you can actually watch the fish go down it takes about a minute for the fish to go down the long neck next slide you can see the plumage here it becomes spectacular during breeding season and um, there's a whole nother topic which i would love to do sometime uh, for, for next time but it's how how we've used the plumage from herons not just the great blue heron but also the especially the white egrets actually um for uh, for in, in decorating women's hats primarily that was um that was uh, a, a major problem at the end of the uh, 19th century you can see herons have gotten used great blue herons have gotten used to being around people and um the next slide they build their nests in tall trees they they uh, they tend to form rookeries where they have m multiple nests close together where they help support each other this is an area off of uh, Lovell between Parfit and Winslow um, there are about 30 nests in this area but uh, the last uh, few the last couple of years that haven't been many birds there you can see the nest they build up a really large collection of, of uh, sticks and, and uh, twigs to, to form the nest and the next slide shows that well it doesn't show it but there's a there's a slide that shows that that predator yeah predators come in and, and destroy the nest sometimes so, um, and for that reason some of the herons have been able to build their nests in, in the water that are growing in, in trees that are growing in water um, and to give them some protection from land-based predators um, there are many b other birds that are common around the water the gulls and terns obviously um, a lot of shorebirds there's a multiple varieties and sizes and colors and shapes of shorebirds and that's a whole other topic but um, I think this is uh, and, and this is this is the related uh, great egret which is another heron that's almost the, the egrets are herons and 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 the, uh, the egret is almost as large as the great blue and um, it is a spectacular bird we have we see them occasionally here um, and then there's uh, well that's that's another another shot of the great egret um, but uh, I, I think that's enough for for today and and we will uh, oh, oh there yeah we, we need to see the last slide I, I had to finish this <laughs> <laughs> something appropriate for the week <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I want to thank you very much. That was uh, very informative. I learned a lot. I think I have misidentified uh, Osprey uh, based on that picture, but uh, yeah. 
Uh, and and yes, the cormorants are absolutely wonderful to watch in their various stick figurey Halloween like poses. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so thank you. And I am looking forward to the time that you will uh, come back and talk about the women's hats and sort of the way that we use nature until we use it up. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Thank you for all the research that went into this. It, uh, it, we really uh, learned a lot. I, I did anyway, learned a lot. Well, thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Howard. Thanks, Howard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.